Monster in the Closet is about exactly that. The scary monster you imagine is in your closet. Except now, it's real. Troma busted out all the stops on this one with some pretty big names, including John Carradine, Fergie, Kevin Peter Hall, and Paul Walker? Yeah, before he was racing cars, he was playing this nerd in Monster in the Closet. First off, this movie isn't to be taken too seriously. Like most other trauma movies, this is a horror comedy. And boy oh boy is there a lot of dumb moments in this movie. Like for example, they think it's really important for the audience to know the date and time. It comes up like every five minutes. First, the monster attacks a girl in a sorority. Well, she's dead. Nice poster. Now, a blind John Carradine is looking for his slippers, his seeing eye dog unwilling to help. Here's a question for you. If he's blind, then why are the lights on in his house? Well, yep, he goes into the closet and is attacked. Or... At least he throws a bunch of clothes out. Now we get this little girl, who's played by a young Fergie. She's killed in the closet. Again, with clothes going everywhere. Okay, we get it. Is there a plot to this movie? Well, yes actually. It's not just people getting killed in their closets. Here we're at the Daily Planet, or, or I mean the Daily Globe, and we meet Clark Kent, or, I mean Richard Clark. Sorry about that. He goes to talk to his boss when another rival reporter comes in, Scoop. Scoop pulls an old story out of the trash and makes it look like a promotion for old Richard. He's working the obituaries, so anything is better than that. Okay, kid, run with it. Happily, he takes the job, which leads him to Chestnut Hills, California. First he meets with a young Paul Walker, whose name is Professor. Really, that's not a nickname, his name is Professor. Whatever. The Professor's a pretty big nerd. He records everything and he tells Richard about an experiment he's been working on. The Ultrasonic Energy Augmenter, whatever that is. Ultrasonic Energy Augmenter. Richard gives him a crunch bar, something his mother, Diane, wouldn't allow him to have. Pay attention to crunch bars in this movie. I'm pretty sure Nestle is a paid sponsor. Anyway, Diane is at the police station to try to help with all the murders that have been happening around the town. The deaths we saw in the beginning. Each victim had snake-like puncture holes in them, except they were inches apart, which would be a pretty big snake, so they think she's nuts. Richard and the sheriff go to where the first victim was found, the local college campus, and right next door, there's another attack. Okay, this joke is actually pretty funny. There's this lady taking a shower, right? And you see a dark figure coming up, a la Psycho. Hi, hon. Lo and behold, it's just the lady's husband. But they do this false scare over and over and over again. It gets to the point where it's actually pretty funny. Well, the husband goes into the closet to get his car keys. Not sure why people would store their keys in a closet, but here we are. And as you might have guessed it, he's attacked, adding one more to the monster's body count. The guys hear his wife screaming and rush over, only to see that they were too late. But Richard does find what looks like one of the creature's claws on the ground. This guy's dead as a doornail. He takes it over to the school to get it analyzed, and here's where he's properly introduced to Professor Diane Bennett. Hi. After she looks at the claw a bit, she calls for help from Dr. Pennyworth, who apparently found the cure for cholera. He's interested in the claw and wants to know more, so he takes it and agrees to share his findings tonight at dinner. 
Later that night at Diane's place, they all get to talking for a while about nothing really. But when Richard cleans his glasses, there's just something. Oh, sorry, I don't know what came over me. That's precisely the point. Defenseless creatures. The professor takes Richard upstairs to show him his experiment, which is totally cool. I know that I'd let my kids take a totally random stranger up to their bedrooms. Luckily, Richard isn't like that, and he shows genuine interest in the professor's experiments. But it's interrupted by a commotion outside. The cops show up, and everyone gathers around. The monster is close. The police have this place surrounded, and that's when it breaks out, giving us a real good look at it. I don't know what to say. I kind of like it, especially its little tail. In the suit is Kevin Peter Hall, the monster suit master. He played the Predator, and more importantly, Harry from Harry and the Hendersons. A pretty good get for such a low budget movie. They open fire on the creature, which does nothing. Its tongue comes out like a knockoff xenomorph, because that's what it is, and it tosses the sheriff like a rag doll. Now, Richard's story just got a bit more interesting. After seeing the success he had inadvertently handed over to Richard, Scoop wants to get in on the action. Hey, Dicky boy! But Diane has already fallen for Rich, so he gets first dibs on the story and on her. Pennyworth is listening to the recording the professor did right before the attack, and we hear some notes played on a xylophone. Could this be a way to communicate with it? We've just found the key. At this point, the military's called in as a state of national emergency and they think they've discovered a pattern to the creature attacks, pinpointing to where it will go next, the professor's elementary school. Everyone rushes over, but it would seem like they're too late, seeing the monster carry him away. Richard tries to stop it, but the creature has super strength, and he carries both of them to the nearest closet. Their only hope is to rip the professor's shirt and get him free. Everyone escapes, and the military surrounds the school. However, Pennyworth begs them to let him try to communicate with it. It's worth a shot, why not? Playing his xylophone, he heads in closer and closer to the monster. It looks like it's working, but psych! The monster's tongue pops out and kills Pennyworth. So, that didn't work. The military open fire, and they don't hold back. But once again, it doesn't do anything to the creature. All hope is lost at this point, so they decide to evacuate the town. Our heroes are gathered at Pennyworth's funeral when Scoops has the gall to start asking Diane questions. So Richard knocks his lights out. His glasses falling off. As he does. Phew. The group hasn't given up hope yet and have a new theory on how to destroy it. The only way to stop the monster. We must destroy all its energy. It has something to do with the claw that they found and it having super fast electrons moving in it. It's enough of a theory for them to work with, so they get started setting up a trap. At first, it seems to work after Richard entices the monster with a Nestle's crunch. It's trapped, getting hit with electricity. But this thing is strong enough to fight it, breaking it down. They run upstairs where they find the professor still working on his experiment, which he now thinks can kill the creature. However, he's sorely mistaken, because it doesn't do diddly. Except knock Diane into Richard, and Man, is he good looking. Apparently, I'm not the only one who thinks that either, because the monster falls head over heels in love with a glasses-less Richard. It carries him off and all over town. And that's when Diane gets an idea. 
it can't attack if it doesn't have a closet to attack from. So she orders everyone all across the world to destroy their closets. Chop, burn, whatever you need to do, just get rid of your closet. Her plan, albeit a bit extreme, works. The monster is stuck and is too weak to kill. However, one janitor's closet is left in the Trans-American building. The only problem is, it's not big enough for both the monster and Richard. Unable to let go of such a dashingly good-looking man, the monster gives up and dies right there on the street. Because in the end, it was beauty boys, killed the beast. Boys, that's enough already. And that was Monster in the Closet. What a wild ride. Honestly, it was a pretty fun movie. Smart and sophisticated? No, but fun. The bit with Richard's glasses always falling off was kind of funny, and there's subtle jokes throughout the whole thing, so it never gets too boring. It has that unique trauma feel, for better or for worse. For example, some of the scenes are pretty dark and hard to see. You can still make out what's happening on screen, but just a little bit more light would have been nice. Although not necessary, it would have been nice to have a little bit more gore. Even some cheap looking guts hanging out of the body would have been better than just them throwing clothes out of the closet door. Speaking of the effects, however, I loved the look of the monster. Seriously, it doesn't look too bad and it's animated well. Dare I wonder what this thing would look like nowadays with a bigger budget and some CGI to assist the practical effects? Now, I know it's blasphemy, and I wouldn't seriously consider it, but maybe it's time for a remake of Monster in the Closet? I'm just throwing that out there, Hollywood. Monster in the Closet is cheap, guilty pleasure fun that everyone should watch at least once. Just be in the mood for more of a comedy than a horror. I give it three Nestle Crunch Bars out of four. I'll be a good doggy and bring old Joe his slippers. <laughs>